Hello and welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield and this is a podcast about our deepest values, the ways ideas shape us, and how we might build empathy and understanding for people who might be very different from ourselves. In these increasingly divided times, I have made a practice of listening deeply and I hope with curiosity and openness to a range of guests from all manner of different professions, perspectives and points on the political spectrum. I want to understand the principles that drive them and how they've come to some of the conclusions that they've reached. I'm basically interested in the three-dimensional person behind what is usually a two-dimensional public persona. I've spoken to actors and archbishops, artists and activists, poets and politicians, farmers and philosophers. It's my shame, I usually come with some prejudices and misconceptions and almost always end up a bit humbled. If you feel like listening across our differences is important, if you feel like you've learned anything or changed your mind on anything through listening to The Sacred, please would you consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or sharing an episode with a friend. I am sure there will be at least one episode that you can see would spark a deeper conversation with someone than you would necessarily normally be able to have. In this episode, I spoke to Paul Kingsnorth. Paul is an award-winning novelist and essayist, perhaps currently best known for his substack, which is called The Abbey of Misrule. We spoke about his deep and ongoing environmental commitments, his recent conversion to Christianity, and why he has real concerns about the technological and bureaucratic context of the COVID vaccine rollout. As always, my reflections are at the end, and I hope you enjoy listening. Paul. I am going to ask you a uh, not standard small talk or podcast opening warming up question, but I'm going to give you a couple of seconds uh, before I get to what is sacred to you by just asking, how does the word feel for you? You're a writer, you care deeply about words. How does the word sacred land? Um, It's one of those words like spiritual, which is um, so vague as to be useless in a way. Um, but also not really replaceable with anything else. I've, been, I've spent years trying to work out whether there's a better word than spiritual to use when we talk about these things because it's such a horrible word, but there isn't. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I feel the same about the word sacred, actually. I mean, it has quite a specific meaning in a way, but it, it's one of those words that can mean anything to anyone, so you have to be really careful how you use it. I would try and give you some parameters, but you feel free to completely ignore them. Well, you've probably uh, thought about it a lot more than I have, given that it's the title of your podcast, so you can yes. tell me how to yes. do it. Yes, it's one of my favourite words. And obviously, um, you know, it's often translated in religious contexts as holy, and mm. um, that's people are very familiar with it in that use. But I have a hunch that we can use it as a way of getting to our very deep motivations and our very deep values um, that are often clashing in public. And I was yeah. um, originally inspired by an anthropologist called Scott Atran, who uses it a lot in peace building and reconciliation. He says people apply the kind of rational actor, you know, rational economic theory to peace building and reconciliation. And they just say, if we can just get everyone's self-interest aligning and we can get, you know, these people enough money and these people enough comfort, then we'll be able to fix this deep division that we have. And he says there's actually some sacred values at play, which are not economic values, are not kind of rational actor values. Mm. They, they, they sit somewhere different, somewhere deep in us. And if you offer someone money to give up a sacred value, they will be less likely mm. um, well, to want to reconcile with you. Because certainly hope so, that. yeah. Well, Repulsion. it's interesting. I, now that you say that, it makes me think about it. I wrote an essay called In the Black Chamber, which was about visiting a cave in France, um, uh, which had Paleolithic cave paintings in it, and which I did with my family years ago, going to see these paintings and being struck by this huge, awesome sense of, of the sacred when I was there. And I wasn't uh, religious at that time. And I was trying to work out what this was. And I remember writing in that essay what the meaning of the word sacred was and also the meaning of the word holy. And they're quite interesting when you look at the etymology because sacred comes from this word, I think it's a Latin word, sacrare, which means to set apart. So something that's sacred is set apart from other things, from the normal things, from the worldly things, I suppose. Holy is from an old English word, halig, which means whole. Um, so something that's holy is whole and something that's sacred is set apart. And it's quite interesting. So in that sense, 
if you're asking what is sacred and what does it mean, as you said just then, actually, the sacred is something that's set apart from whatever your worldly concerns might be, right? Whether you're earning enough money or whether you're doing something you like or whether you're healthy or where you live or all of these things, which, you know, we all have those concerns. But the sacred is something way beyond that. Mm. And it's not, it doesn't, it can't have a price on it. And also, this is what vexes people in the modern West. You can't explain it. You can't pin it down. You can't put numbers on it. You can't rationalize it. And there are things that this is what really frustrates modern people, especially intellectual people. You can't, there are some things that you can't reach with your rational mind, which is what every religion in the world has always taught. And we are absolutely determined to ignore in the modern world. We think we can work everything out and we hate the idea that we can't, but we can't. And the, the sacred in some ways is the thing that we can't work out. And the only way you can reach it is through letting go of all that, which is why, mm. say, you know, if, if you go to the, the, the New Testament, what does Christ talk about all the time? He talks about faith. His whole life is about faith. It's about saying, I'm just going to trust this, even if it gets me crucified, because that's the only way you can see the truth, mm. which is a terrible message because, we, you know, it, it, it means we're not in control and we can't work things out. But that's, that's true. That's the reality of it. And that's a, it's kind of a hard lesson in a way, especially for modern people, I think. Yeah. It, um, it feels to me like something about the sacred demands surrender mm. and surrender is not at all comfortable, but the older I get, I'm just, I'm trying to be done with cool. I'm trying to pursue wisdom and the wise people, the, pe the people who seem to have weathered the like struggle and suffering of life and come out not bitter, not apathetic, you know, not cynical, not shut down or madly hedonistic seem to me to have surrendered to something at mm. some point. Right. But it's so countercultural to our. Yeah, totally. It's, well, it's sacrifice is what it is. And again, you know, from a Christian perspective, I mean, as you know, we'll, we'll, you might want to talk about this, but I weirdly became a Christian in the last few years entirely unexpectedly. And um, that was kind of the, uh, people talked to me about having converted, but I didn't feel like I'd converted. I felt like I'd, I'd come back to something I, I didn't know I was in the first place because the teachings, the actual ancient teachings of Christi Christianity, and I've, I'm an Orthodox Christian, are not what I thought they were. Uh, and they're all, they're all built around sacrifice. They're all built around walking away from the world, which actually is what, is what we're being taught um, in, in the Gospels. We're being taught that we have to let go. And I think that the whole of the conclusion I've come to recently is the whole of the modern world, the whole of the modern post-Enlightenment West is a rebellion against that notion. The whole of our project is a rebellion against God. It's a rebellion against the idea that we're not in control. And we seek to use technology and science and, and our rational minds to grip and control the world. And you can do that to a certain degree. We can create lots of funky machines, but then look at the consequences of that. Now the climate's changing and we still don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we're even more lost than we were before. And we're horrified by the possibility that actually all along, some of these old religious teachings might have been right. And as you say, I mean, I, I have a similar thing to you, actually. I look, as I'm getting older now, I, I look at the, the older people in society and I say, Where, where's the wisdom to be found? Because if I can find wise people, then I know that they're in a, they're in a true tradition. Not everybody in a, following a tradition is going to end up wise. But if you're doing it properly, you will do. So where are the saints? You know, where are the elders? Where are the mystics? That's where the wisdom is. That's where the truth is. There aren't any in... Um, there aren't any in the new atheist movement, put it that way. You know, there aren't any in the, in the kind of rationalist, rationalist control society that we're living in at the moment. And it's, you know, that we're coming, I, th I think we're sort of, be, we're going to be dragged back to the terrifying reality that we have to let go, that we're not in control, and that the things that we consider to be meaningful are actually not creating meaning for us. No, I think we kind of, we sort of know that at some level already. But we don't want to have to deal with it because it would mean changing our <laughs> the entire worldview of our society. Yeah. And we no longer are part of communities, right? The sort of often the morally formative communities who could carry you through that kind of life arc mm. um, are, are gone. I really want to dig in with you to this idea of the machine and and uh, the kind of intellectual and emotional and spiritual journey you've been on. But first, I am going to try and pin you down to uh, what do you think might be sacred to you? What are some of the values that you th and the theory around this is you don't really know. It's a like semi-conscious thing, but you mm. feel it when something's transgressed. And yes. um 
bracket out your family, you know, bracket out those kind of concepts. Do you have, do you have anything bubbling up of, of a value that might be sacred to you or a, a something that might be sacred to you? Well, for most of my life, it was the natural world. I mean, that was, you know, I was an environmental activist for a long time, but before that, I was just a, a young person who had a strong sense that there's something sacred in nature. Although I wouldn't have used that word because I wasn't brought up to draw like that. But the, 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 the things that got me writing about this, acting on this, when I was younger, were a sense of violation when we um, ravage something of natural beauty. So, say the destruction of a primal rainforest is such an act of, of it, it is, it feels like a rape, it's just like an act of supreme violation of something that should not be violated. Um, the, the poisoning of water, the destruction of, of ancient landscapes. Um, I feel the same about the destruction of ancient human cultures, actually. It's a similar sort of thing, that the, the kind of mass industrial destruction of nature for profit or just for utility is, is, is a kind of, for me, it's always been a violation at a level that can't be explained. I mean, we can all talk about carbon emissions and sustainability and all of this stuff, but that, that, and that's fine, but it's not that. It's something else. Uh, it's, a, it's a strong sense that there is something deeply deeply sacrilegious going on actually and that's so I've always had that and I still have that and that funnily enough has led me to a, I, I think now that I look back I can say that was always a religious sensibility although I would never put it like that there was always a strong sense that something was sacred which is why I've always been very uncomfortable with a certain type of environmentalism which talks in numbers you know and, and, and tries to rationalize the world I understand why people do that but it's not the point seems to me that life is, is, the natural world is a sacred thing. And if we've got a society that can destroy it in the way that we do, something's really wrong. And I think I tried to work out for my whole life what, what that was. So yes, it, it, was, it was always nature for me from a very young age. And am I, I'd love to hear a bit about your, your childhood and, and that period. Am I right in thinking that came partly through your dad and, and spending time in nature with him? Yeah, my dad accidentally made me an environmentalist. He didn't want me to be. My dad, <laughs> my dad was a my dad was a businessman who wanted me to be a kind of a successful lawyer or something like that. So he didn't get his way. But he did. Um, he loved walking in the country, and he used to take me on very long mountain walks when we were kids. For a couple of weeks, we'd walk the long distance paths of of Britain, the Pennine Way, and the uh, Offa's Dyke Path, and uh, all, all the other kind of long distance tracks. And we'd camp in the hills. And that had a really powerful effect on me because I, I grew up in kind of suburban England in a very kind of ordinary ordinary way, perfectly fine suburban life, but uninspiring for me because I was a romantic child and I wanted to be living in um, the Shire, really, you know, <laughs> or something like that. Rohan, ideally, not not High Wycombe. Um, so, yeah, but that, that had a very, very powerful effect on me, uh, just uh, experiencing these, you know, waking waking up in the tent and watching the sunrise over the mountain. Um, yeah, so my, my dad accidentally gave me a, a strong love of the natural world. I mean, I think he had it too, but he would never have framed it in the same way. Give me a sense. I know you were an environmentalist. Were you primarily a campaigner, primarily a kind of writer about the environment? Well, um, I, I went to university, and when I was at university in the early 90s, um, there was a big road protest movement going on in England. There were a lot of roads being built. The government said they were building the biggest, uh, they had the biggest road building program since the Romans, they used to like boasting. This was the Tory government back at the time, and they were slamming these roads and motorways through all these areas of natural beauty. And this great road protest movement arose, and it was quite, it was a very particular moment. It sort of arose out of, a, partly out of the traveller movement. There were a lot of sort of crusties who'd been thrown out of Stonehenge, but there were also a lot of students was um, it the sort of swampy era? That's it what was I the swampy era, definitely. He was one of my contemporaries, was swampy. Um, yeah, and he became a micro-celebrity for a while. So there was a real counterculture there, but it wasn't... What was interesting about it, it wasn't just the sort of crusty traveller ethic and a few students like me. There were, you know, there were a lot of sort of middle-class, middle-aged ladies who would bake cakes and bring them along to the protest sites. And there were public school boys who would join and all this sort of stuff. And it was, it was a very... It, certainly when I was involved in places like Twyford Down and Newbury, it was a very kind of English thing, actually. It, it, it seemed to go back in a sort of very particular English tradition of, of rebellion against the state. And it was very tied up with a notion of the sacred land. And there was lots of stuff about stone circles and sacred trees and a bit of paganism in there. But it was, it was great, actually. And I just went along and got involved as a student. So it was perfect. I was the perfect age for it. And I spent a lot of time kind of up trees and down tunnels and things, getting arrested for putting myself in front of bulldozers and all that stuff. And that, that just radicalized me, really, because I thought 
okay, well, I live in a society which is prepared to destroy a hill with an ancient monument and an ancient forest on the top of it so that it can save three and a half minutes on the journey from London to Winchester, right? So that's the society whose values are in the toilet, as far as I'm concerned. There's, that's, that has to be opposed. And I still believe that, um, although I don't go on the protests anymore. Um, we've, gone, we've gone even further down the toilet since then. So that was what radicalised me. And what, once you start doing something like that, you start asking all the questions. Why have we got these values? Who's running the society? What, why is this happening? Why are we building these roads? And then you start coming to conclusions about the global economy and consumerism and capitalism and growth and all of the other big things. And then you think, if you're 21, oh my God, the whole world's wrong. And then you have to spend the next 20 years writing about it, which is what I did. And when did the, um, I kind of, the shorthand in my head is the Dark Mountain turn. Tell me a bit about the Dark Mountain project and what was the, the shift happening in you and Dougald and others around that project in, at that time? Yeah, well, for me, it was, um, I think I'd spent about 20 years as an activist. I'd written two books. One of them was about globalization and how it was trashing cultures and nature around the world. And another one was a book about England, um, which actually wrote about the same subject, but on a, on a kind of local level in my country and how local cultures were being ravaged by what I call the machine um, and people fighting back against it. So I'd done all this and I'd been a, a kind of idealistic activist and I'd hoped we could turn things around. But you know, as as you grow up, <laughs> you start thinking we're not going to we're not going to turn things around. There's you know, there there are things you can do on a local level. There are things you can do at a national level. But if you look at the grand scheme of things, if you look at the direction of society globally, um, you're not going to stop the climate changing. You're not going to stop um, the direction of, of of industrial growth and progress because people want it and there are huge interests behind it. And so I became, um, as a lot of people do quite disillusioned about the possibility of changing things um it's it's it's, it's a sort of fairly i suppose it's a cliche journey you go from a young idealistic activist to being <laughs> a more disillusioned man but i was because i was a writer i was looking around at the culture this was about 10 more than 10 years ago now and and thinking okay the climate is changing we're clearly in for a huge probably systemic collapse at this point right because all of the forces are converging we're crossing all of the planetary boundaries. Um, society is unsustainable in every way, ecologically, culturally, spiritually. We, we, it felt like we were kind of standing on the edge of this precipice, but no one was talking about it. And it, we, everyone, including all the activists, was still pretending that kind of one more push would get us through. Or, uh, And as a novelist, I was, uh, I'd written novels and I was looking out at other novelists and the culture generally and thinking, no one's really writing about this actually in any way. So... Um, I wanted to, I, I just wanted to get together. I had a, a notion that we, I, I'd get a few people together and we'd be like the Inklings, like C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, and we'd all sit together in the pub and have a little literary movement. And um, I just wrote something about that on my blog I had at the time, and this guy, Dougal, who I'd never heard of before, got in touch and said, this sounds interesting, I'd like to get involved. And we ended up, cut a long story short, writing this little manifesto called Uncivilization 2009, which was a call for writers and artists to take the collapse seriously and to create culture as if it, it was real. And that kind of spiraled, got a bit out of control. We ended up running festivals and having a project and running journals, and we were sort of um, making it up as we went along. So it was a bit chaotic, but we did some good work, I think, and it's still going. But Dark Mountain was, um, was a movement that came out of that sort of desire for people to get real, actually, about where we were. And interestingly, more than 10 years later, it's a lot of people acknowledge that now. I mean, there's kind of stuff we were publishing on our, in our books in the early days, when people were calling us nutters and telling us we needed therapy because we were depressed, um, you can now read in the New York Times. So it's quite interesting to see the shift of lots. It's, it's become harder and harder to deny the reality of, of kind of where we are. Yeah. And in Savage Gods, I think, or from some of your writing at the time, you talk about losing faith in words and a bit losing faith in nature and losing faith in progress. How much would you have identified as someone who was broadly left wing before that? Were you were you losing faith in that movement as well? Yeah, I seem to do a lot of losing faith in things, don't I? <laughs> now that you mention it, um, yeah, my Savage Gods period was was a bit later. It was just after, it's just before I ended up becoming a Christian. And when I look back at it, it's a kind of midlife spiritual, break, midlife spiritual breakdown, basically, <laughs> which which is exactly a precursor. I didn't know what was coming. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I suppose I was a, a sort of a man of the left in a broad sense. I've never been a kind of a socialist or a Marxist or anything. I've always been very anti-utopian, actually. Um, in some ways, I was a, a leftist. I, I was anti-capitalist. I still am. In other ways, I was quite conservative, quite traditionalist. You know, I, I'm, I've always been a, a fan of, you know, people like Chesterton and Orwell who managed to combine a sort of um, anti-capitalist radicalism with a sort of traditionalist sensibility, which I quite like. There's not enough of that around. Um, so, yeah, but I was I was certainly moving with the, the, the sort of the green left, and I, I just certainly lost faith in that, but it was a broader s- sense of losing faith in politics, really. But, but what happened with that? Savage Gods, I moved here to Ireland um, and we set up a small holding. Um, and I suppose it was part of me that thought, oh, great, I can have a nice, easy, peaceful existence now, but that wasn't, <laughs> wasn't going to happen. Um, but I also, you know, I, having sort of lost faith in activism, I then started losing faith in writing because I thought, I, I got to the point where I thought, I've, done, I've, I've written a lot of books, eight or nine books, and I don't quite know anymore what writing can reveal. If it got to the point where words felt like they were a wall instead of a window. You know, because at its best, writing can show people what the world's like. But when you're a writer, you can get so jammed up with words that you get confused between words and reality. You lose, you lose track of the thing the words are trying to point at. So I think that's where I was. I sort of, basically everything, everything worldly that I'd put my faith in, I basically by this point had lost faith in which felt terrible, but was actually really necessary now that I look back on it. It was just a grand process of going through, looking at the world, seeing that it's wrong, because we can all do that, and then trying everything from writing to politics to whatever it is, activism, to try and fix it in a kind of arrogant intellectual way, and then realizing you can't. And that's a realization of the limits of your power and a a limit of limits of, of worldly things. And at that point, you have a sort of spiritual crisis. And if you're lucky, that's a precursor to, <laughs> to going, oh, right, something else is going on that's much bigger than all this, which is, yeah, it's sort of where I ended up. And I'm right in thinking that your um, Christianity sort of wasn't the first wisdom tradition or faith tradition or religion, whatever you want to call it, that you'd encountered. You had a period of being a kind of Wiccan Zen mixture? Yeah, you could say that. At the same time as having gone through these sort of rolling crises of faith in worldly things, I was I was exploring the spiritual alternatives from, from about the age of 40 or so, late 30s, I started realizing, okay, I'm going to have to start um, seeing what else there is. And I, I'd always been interested in Buddhism, so I went on some Buddhist retreats. I became a Zen Buddhist for a while, did a lot of work, did a lot of reading and studying and practice. And, uh, you know, Zen is a really interesting tradition that can sort of wreak some profound changes in you because you spend a lot of time sitting on a cushion just examining the reality of yourself and realizing that a lot of it isn't there. And a lot of what you thought was yourself is not yourself. It's just a bunch of stuff you've constructed, and that can really break the world open very usefully. Um, but it, hadn't, it's, it didn't meet, in the end, the kind of need I'd always had for I suppose it was a, I don't know if it was a need for worship, but it was a need for connection with this this great sort of power in the universe, this great thing that runs through nature. Um, because Zen can be quite dry. Um, and I felt like the, the, the terrible realization for me was that I was talking about God, which I never wanted to do because obviously growing up as a good little boy in an atheist society, we all knew that that was nonsense. But I felt like I needed uh, I needed a connection with with God or with gods. Um, but uh, being a nature lover, I thought, well, I you know, I, I, what I need is to be some sort of pagan. I need some sort of pagan religion here that will connect me to the gods of nature. So I was looking around through druidry and all sorts of things, and I ended up with Wicca, with modern witchcraft, which is a weird little mashup of the Western magical tradition and and, um, and neo paganism and all sorts of other bits and pieces. Um, and it was interesting, I think, because, yeah, I was just, I was looking for something and the last place I would ever have looked for it would have been, say, in Christianity or because that's, it's very interesting in, in the West, in countries like Britain, um, 
you know, we're Christian countries and we, we're, that's our heritage, that's our culture, that's formed all of our values. And yet when we look for God, we don't go anywhere near the church, which mm-hmm. is certainly a failing of the church. But it's also a failing of uh, there's something in society that just makes us run away from it. It's very interesting. So we'll look everywhere else. And, and, and also almost every other religion is more socially acceptable than Christianity as well. You know, it's the only thing that people will look at and say, well, you did what? Yeah. You know, I, I, was, I, I had no problem being a Buddhist or a witch, but as soon as I became a Christian, people looked at me as if I, could, I had a mental breakdown. So, it's, <laughs> so that's very interesting. But yeah, I, ended, I, I became a Wiccan. And um, yeah, again, that, that, so, yeah, there's some truths in that faith, but there's also some dark things in there which are not, which are not good. Um, and fundamentally also, it's just largely, it's a modern made-up religion that attempts to fill the gap that has been left by the retreat of Christianity, and that's there's so much of that in in the culture. I mean, it's you know if you want to find a kind of or build a kind of sort of new agey mashup of every bit of faith on earth with bits of other faiths just stuck in there, then you can get that anywhere because there's such a I think there's such a hunger. There's a real hunger for God, for faith, for religion. But we don't know how to fill it, so we just scrabble around with all sorts of things, and that's. I realized with horror that that's what I've been doing all my life, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there it is. We're going to talk about vaccines in a little bit. And I often think that um, it feels like British people have been inoculated against the, like, powerful strain of Christianity by having had an incredibly mild cultural dose. And so it it, it mm. just kind of, it makes it makes people think they know what they're rejecting Mm. that's really good way of looking at it yeah actually haven't at all yeah no i like that i like that that's really good what um what what made you willing to write about it um so publicly and what's been the experience of that because i would love you know we will talk about the things i would like all people who are who are already christians whenever someone discovers it there's this like yes both (laughs) for them but also, selfishly, I think the kind of some someone else can see, you know, the stories that the culture tells about this, my best thing, my most precious thing, seems so different from my lived experience. So it feels mm. like a win, but that can turn into something slightly weird and grabby and um, yeah. mm. pressurizing for people who have had that experience in public. What's your journey been with that? Yeah, I think I could have made a career for myself being a Christian convert over the last year, actually. Yeah, don't, <laughs> that, like, that seems not wise to me. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I, there's been a lot of people asking me to go on their podcast very kindly. But I mean, you know, I understand it completely because like you say, it's, um, it's, it seems that Christianity is so, it's so on the back foot in the West now that, that, as you say, people coming out of other things and coming into it, discovering it is, is, is like revelatory and it's revelatory to me. And I think... I, I think what you just said is really interesting about the mild dose that we've been inoculated with because I, you know, I, I've written about this, so I, I won't go on about it, but I basically got, I had all sorts of kind of visitations and strange things happening to me and dreams and people coming and talking to me and over, over a long period of time while I was a witch and I, I, I resisted it and then I realized I was basically, I was being hunted by Christ was the way I, I put it and I thought, oh God, this is terrible and wonderful, <laughs> what do I do? Yeah. So I just sort of gave in, and then, and then I realised after a while that I was I, I had to be a Christian. Uh, and then for a while I thought, well, I'll just do it on my own in my bedroom because, you know, I, I'm, I'm that sort of person. I'm not very good at joining things. Um, I can start things, but I can't join them. Maybe that's just arrogance. Um, but I thought, oh, I can't. Obviously, I can't join a church. I'll just be a Christian at home. And then after a while, you realise you can't be a Christian without a church because it's kind of the whole. It's the whole point of it, really. It's the way it works. So then I thought, what's the church? Where's the church? There's about a thousand of them now. In fact, I read recently there are 10,000 Protestant churches in America alone at the moment. Hmm. Astonishingly. So, yeah, and I looked around. I couldn't. The, the Church of England seems to me to be a sort of weak and broken thing, and, and the Catholic Church in Ireland increasingly so. And I sort of ended up in the Orthodox Church. And um, I wrote about it because. Um, well, you know, I, I actually thought I wasn't going to say much. What I did was I was updating my website and I was updating the little about me section and I just put a little thing in there about how I'd become a Christian. And I thought I'll just sort of sneak it out quietly like that. Yeah. And then somebody saw about it and wrote, some, somebody who was a, well, a admirer of my writing saw it and wrote about it. And then that got around. And then I got this magazine 
First Things magazine writing to me and saying, well, would, you like to write us, would you like to write something about how you became a Christian? And I thought, well, since people are talking about it anyway, maybe I will, maybe I'll have a go. I thought it would actually be quite good for me to try and write down what had happened and maybe useful for other people, so I did. And um, yeah, that was, you know, that was, that was good for people. And it's a funny thing because I, I don't really want to be the guy who goes around talking about being a convert all the time. But at the same time, I know that when I've talked about it and written about it, it's been useful because a lot of people write to me now and they say, this, this has happened to me as well. Mm. especially people who've come out of environmentalism, but not just them. People who say, I never wanted to be a Christian, and then all this stuff has happened to me, and what do I do, and where do I go? Yeah. And I'm so glad to have read your, your piece. So it's been useful. So I thought that, yeah, that, that was why I did it. But yeah, you're right. It would be easy to, I could probably have my own YouTube channel just endlessly talking about it all day long. Yeah. But I think that's, there's the danger, you see, because of, because of the, the way the media landscape works at the moment. Yeah. Whatever you're doing, you could make yourself a career just blathering about it. Yeah. But for me, I think if I go back to what I wrote in Savage Gods, you know, it's, it's a danger to get caught up in that because especially if you're, you know, if you're following this this Christian path, this Orthodox path that I'm following, you know, you're supposed to give a lot of your time to prayer and silence, and I'm, you know, that's kind of the opposite of what I do. So it's yeah. difficult. I have to make space for that, and I don't make enough. Yeah. And it would be really easy if you're good at talking or writing just to go on and on and on about this for, for years. Yeah. Um, but not to actually practice it. Yeah. You know, that would be that would be the trap. So I'm yeah. trying to avoid that. Yeah. It's it it it's the first step, right? And then there's and then there's discipleship. I, if it's not too personal, and I'm pretty sure I'll cut this out. I do pray for you every so often, and other people who become Christians in public because the 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 you know. The, the, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. That means a lot. There's a sort of euphoric homecoming, and then everyone, I think, goes through the like <laughs> the moments of the dark night of the soul, or when things get hard. And if if people are expecting you to still be in a euphoric conversion phase, and actually you're in the like, this got real and hard, and I'm just like <laughs> trudging the path. The Yes, till the yeah, next exactly. till the next mountain experience. Then that's mm. too much pressure for anyone. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, I, I think um, that's. I'm quite in a way. There's part of me that thinks I wish this had happened 30 years ago because then I'd have had more of a head start. But there's another part of me that thinks I'm quite glad yeah. it's happened later in life because I'm not so naive about where <laughs> where it's likely to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for the dark night of the soul, you know. So yeah, and, and yeah, you have to. You just have to balance. Um, this kind of, the, the public realm can eat you up very quickly. You know, yeah. it's kind of designed to eat you up and spit you out. Yeah, and um, people, you become a symbol in other people's symbolic games. I think. Yeah, yeah, very easily. Yeah. Um, you also make me think of the John Donne line from The Hound of Heaven that I always come back to because I had a similar. I, had, I anyway, I won't go into it, but he said John Donne said talks about fleeing God. He says I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind, mm. and I love that. Um, mm image but we are going to stop talking about that now because i want to ask you about um vaccines your um essay series the vaccine moment i think uh was very widely read and very widely shared and i'd love to hear when you started feeling uneasy about i think covid vaccination in particular right you hadn't been particularly vaccine hesitant before that well i mean <sighs> The, the, the stuff I was writing about was not really the vaccines. Um, I don't really like this phrase vaccine hesitant because I think it's a bit of a propaganda phrase, the notion okay. that you're hesitant to take the lovely thing, but eventually you're going to take it. Um, I don't have, How would uh, you self-describe? And then I will try well, and use I mean, the phrase. What I was writing about in those essays um, was not really the vaccine. It was the whole system of control that, had driven, that, that built up around it and the whole way that COVID was dealt with. Um, so I suppose... I suppose what happened with me was, uh, you know, along came COVID and we were told there was a deadly virus and we had to shelter in our houses and go into lockdown. And this was, this was all pretty radical stuff, but we sort of did it because we, we thought, well, we better be careful. So that was fine um, for a bit. Um, but then it seemed it, it just became a lot of people, including me, became very nervous about what was going on quite quickly because a lot of what we were being told didn't quite add up in terms of the 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 severity of the illness and the work, the evidence for lockdowns and masks and all the rest of it. And it also became quite clear, very quickly, that there was a media narrative developing, that it was almost impossible to dissent from. And then we started to see that people who did dissent for it were being booted off social media. And we started to see that there was uh, 
a very clear alignment between the government, between the media, between a lot of social media companies on what we had to do. And there was a line, and the line was very clear, terribly dangerous vaccine, we must all be locked, uh, virus, we must all be locked down, and then we must take these vaccines. Um, and if you don't do that, you're going to be, certainly where I live, shut out of society. And in some cases, you're going to be mandated to do that. Now, this is completely unprecedented. There's never been anything like this. Never any any reaction to an illness that involves this level of social control, this level of technological control, this level of conformity amongst the media and the social media community, and the kind of demonization of people who are asking questions. Never seen anything like it. Um, I'm, I'm married to a doctor with a good deal of experience in public health. So, you know, we talked about this a lot and uh, we were all very disturbed about it. So along came these vaccines, which were quite new, quite experimental. We didn't know whether they were going to work. We didn't know what the long-term effects were going to be, and we still don't. Um, and so some people decided to take them and some people didn't, which is fine by me. I don't have a particular opinion about that. If, if you want to be vaccinated, you should be. I think it's worth saying that the things they told us the vaccines were going to do have not been done, right? They haven't prevented any people, they haven't prevented infection or transmission of the illness. Um, but what we got to very quickly was a situation in which this one particular medicine was being used as a tool of social control. So the issue for me is not whether the vaccines are safe or effective. That's up to you to make a personal decision about. I don't, you know, I'm not telling anyone what they should do about that, but for a government and for a society as a whole to create an entire system of technological control and monitoring to, for example, in my country, push anyone who didn't have a vaccine out of society for six months. So if you didn't have a vaccine passport on your smartphone, you couldn't go out effectively. Um, and you had to open the papers every day and watch yourself being called a fascist and a conspiracy theorist by all the newspaper columnists. Because you hadn't taken a vaccine, which... To say the least, there were a lot of question marks over. Now, what this should have been was a was a, a debate, a conversation, a, a, any number of things. So I just found myself in a situation like a lot of people did, where I didn't quite know what was going on. It was very hard to ask the questions. As soon as you open your mouth, people call you all sorts of names. Um, you're told that you're a dangerous person for not taking a vaccine, even though the vaccine doesn't prevent you spreading the illness. And it was just very kind of... Um, it was another revelation, actually. I mean, it was I, in my essays, I wrote about it being apocalyptic in the original sense of the word that apocalypse means revelation. It showed a lot of stuff about how authoritarian society and science and technology could be. So that disturbed me, and it still disturbs me. And as I say, the issue is not really the vaccine. The issue is, the, is all of the control systems that were built around that and the pressure that was put on people to, to conform to that. And it was very disturbing to see what was possible. Mm. You had a line, I think, in one of those essays, if we don't want the future to look like a QR code flickering across a human face forever, we're going to have to do something about it. You know, we've referenced this idea of the machine and your kind of political and social philosophy, I guess, for want of a less shorthand. C could you talk a little bit about this idea of the machine, maybe how it relates to vaccines, but but more broadly that so much of your writing seems to me to be in resistance to? Yeah, I think it is. I think I'm kind of obsessed with it. And that's why I reacted in that way to the vaccines as well, or, or at least to the system that grew up around them. I'm very sensitive, and I've always been, um, to the way that technology is developing, particularly digital technology, as a system of control and management. And this has been going on for a very long time. Um, it's really striking to me that if COVID had come along, say, 10 years ago, or even six or seven years ago, before the smartphone existed, it would not have been possible to put the system of control and monitoring in place that existed. You could not have had vaccine passports. You could not have controlled people as easily as you could. Um, and that's going to get more intense because what's happening is that developing around us very quickly is a system of digital control and monitoring, which is moving us very quickly into what's called the Internet of Things, which will then become the Internet of Bodies as we start start to get the chips inserted under our skin, which is already starting to happen, happen. And this kind of stuff when I was young would have sounded like terrifying science fiction, but it's growing up around us all the time. Um, and it's very interesting to look at this from a religious perspective, I think, because I, what I see is that in the West, we've obviously rejected God, the sacred, the transcendent, anything that's beyond the material realm. And so what can we do? The only thing we can do is attempt to control the material realm and build our own utopia here because we don't believe there's anything better anywhere else. And we do that through technology. 
So we're moving very, very fast into an increasingly globalized system of control and monitoring, which we're going to sell as being and probably believe as being uh, a way of healing the earth and stopping the climate from changing and creating equality and all the other kind of good things that we say that we want. And we're in danger of walking, sleepwalking into the kind of thing that science fiction writers have been warning us about for 100 years, which is a kind of brave new world of technological control and monitoring where we cannot escape the kind of eye of Sauron on the smartphone in our pockets or the chip under our skin. But it's all done in the name of public good. And that's what I saw with COVID. People really believed this was being done in the name of the public good. And I understood that. But if you actually looked at what was happening to people who dissented, if you actually looked at the impossibility of questioning the science that we were all supposed to be following, it was really terrifying and how there was just no possibility of a conversation for a long time. And what made it, what came home to me was that if you can tell people that something's going to keep them safe, they're prepared to put up with a lot of, of, of things that they shouldn't be prepared to put up with. So this thing I call the machine, I suppose, is this, is this global technological system which is rising very, very fast around us now and which I regard as really increasingly sinister, not because it's run by a secret evil cabal, but because the, the ability to control whole populations and monitor them in the name of the public good is so obviously going to get out of hand very quickly, as it already has. I mean, you can use other examples. You can see people being arrested for saying things on social media that other people don't like. I mean, literally being taken out of their home in handcuffs for causing people anxiety by expressing their opinion. Um, once you get to the possibility, once you get to the situation where you've got very, very high levels of technological control and monitoring and a society in which nobody has a kind of moral center and no one can agree on what's right and wrong, then you've got endless possibilities for technological conflict. And, and so that's, that's my fear for the future. And as, as the climate changes and as systems continue to collapse, there's going to be more and more incentive to create these great systems of control that attempt to solve those problems. And I think that's where we're going. So, so that's just kind of obsessed me for a long time, I think. And I saw, saw with COVID that happening. And, and the, the balance is always trying to write about that without becoming paranoid or giving into the sort of wilder conspiracy theories that are out there, but also not being naive about what's going on. So it's a bit of a razor's edge you have to try and walk on. Yeah. Not always successfully, perhaps. The vaccine thing seemed to be one of many incredibly painful divides. And I know that, you know, people in families have had to stop talking about it. Have you lost friends? What's the kind of emotional journey been of being someone who's, who's publicly trying to create space for that conversation oh yeah no i definitely got i got attacked by people who i'd considered to be friends in the past um i mean i'm i'm not on social media so i don't know most of the things that people are saying about me which is helpful <laughs> that's the way i keep myself sane but yeah definitely i got i got attacked for that um and i got criticized for that and mostly i mean the frustrating thing i think for a lot of people whatever side of the debate you're on is just the is the kind of misrepresentation or the refusal of people to actually listen to what you're saying so, you know, with, with, the, with the issue of vaccines, you can write yourself a 5,000 word essay in which you try and explain everything you're saying and someone will just go, oh, he's an anti-vaxxer. He's one of them. He's probably on the far right. So that's all we need to know about him. Uh, and it's just very, very frustrating to see that that's, that's part of the, co the cultural division in society at the moment, that people are just putting each other into boxes, deciding who the enemy is uh, and then going for them. And it's and social media and the algorithms of social media are a big part of the problem there because they just divide us against each other. There's a lot of money and clicks to be made in, in going down that kind of route of demonizing the other. I sometimes try and guess what someone will say their sacred value is when I'm reading and thinking and listening to them. And I did wonder if freedom might come up for you because of this fear of authoritarianism and control. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, it's a, yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Because there's a lot of different types of freedom. Um, in one sense, yes, totally. I'm, <clears throat> I'm really, really sensitive to big systems of control because they're always tyrannical. Um, they've always been tyrannical throughout history and they can be extra tyrannical when you have this degree of, of technology. On the other hand, there's, an, an, there's a, a particular analysis of the notion of freedom which you see a lot in America, this kind of very individualistic, very libertarian kind of freedom which ends up uh, kind of flowing quite easily into selfishness. It's just, it's just me, basically. I, I want to be able to do what I want. 
So I have a conflicted relationship with it. I think in one sense you could say that the individualism of the modern West is all about a desire for freedom. It's all about all of us saying, I should be able to do what I want with no social controls on me. Um, and that actually causes a form of social collapse in itself, because if we're all choosing to just follow our passions, as we put it in the Orthodox Church, um, all the time and demanding the right to do that in the name of our individual freedom, then we don't have a society and we're not paying attention to each other. So there, I think there are probably different kinds of freedom to think about. I, I'm, I'm entirely opposed to giant control systems, and I would like all politics to be radically localized um, so that those systems don't exist, which will never happen, but I still want it to. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to... I suppose if I look at it from a Christian perspective, you know, what, what would a Christian idea of freedom be? It wouldn't be this kind of selfish, radical individualism where we just say, I can do what the hell I want, and it doesn't matter what happens to my neighbor. Um, but at the same time, it would not be bowing down before a giant system of control and doing what you're told. So I suppose there's a kind of sense of community freedom, maybe, that you need to assert. Freedom, freedom from giant systems, but maybe responsibility for other human beings. I don't quite know how you put that. So, but freedom is another one of those words. It's a bit like the sacred, actually, that people can project anything they want onto. So you probably have to define it carefully. But yeah, freedom without selfishness sounds like a good thing. Huh. Yes. Um, you've alluded to becoming without intending to be a controversial figure. And obviously anyone talking about vaccines or, or you know, you've t written about Brexit. There's certain topics that wherever you sit on them will make you you know, quote unquote, controversial. And, um, you know, one of the narratives about you is that you've moved from the left to the right, which I think is a misunderstanding of how complicated those categories are and what they even mean anymore. But, you know, you have described and been in spaces that are right on the fracture points of kind of culture war, deepening division deepening sense that it's really hard to hold people who disagree with us on these neuralgic issues as fully human. Mm. And I was really kind of grateful and encouraged to see you writing about the temptation in yourself, the partisan temptation, you know, to write people off as sheeple, to say, you know, these who think differently from me are malicious enemies of truth, to do the thing we all do, which is to get that little hip of, hit of dopamine when we read mm. someone who agrees with us because they make us feel great, you know, like mm. self-righteous, and to feel hard feelings when we, agree, when we read someone who disagrees with us, so just to avoid that unless we want to feel angry. What are your practices or habits or even aspirations is what it is sometimes for me to be someone who is not making those divisions worse. Yeah, I think it's the most important thing to think about, isn't it? People like to put me in boxes. They like to put everyone in boxes. But I've always really wanted to avoid boxes, actually. I, don't, I hate them. I, <laughs> maybe that's just my radical individualism. But, you know, the notion that I've moved from the left to the right, for example. I mean, I was never on the left, and now I'm not on the right. So I don't, I don't even know what these terms mean. And there's nobody's gang that I want to join. There are certainly, you know, there's a lot of my politics that you might say was conservative or traditionalist with a small c anyway um but there's a lot of other parts that get me called a socialist by some people so it i, I actually don't feel i mean i've certainly you know i've become older and wiser and probably more traditionalist than i used to be but actually i don't feel fundamentally that i believe radically different things to what i believed in 20 years ago um but it's there's more of an appetite now for putting people in boxes like you say and there's more of an appetite for dehumanizing people one of the things I do is I don't go on social media ever, for example. I haven't had any social media accounts for a long time because I think those places, especially some, something like Twitter, is a, is an atmosphere in which even if you're trying to have a conversation, you're not going to be able to. They're designed. I think the algorithms are designed to dehumanize the people you're attacking or talking about there. They're designed for war, so don't do that. Um, and what I, the other thing I do is when I'm writing about these issues... I try never to personalize them, so I don't I very rarely write about individual people or even organizations. I try to write about the big themes. So when I was writing about Brexit, for example, I saw Brexit from the perspective of an environmentalist, as small as beautiful greenie, which is what I always was. And I said, look, I don't like big systems, so don't like the EU. Um, I, you know, I, I, like, I like sort of sovereignty and localization. And there are lots of people who disagree with that, but I didn't write about them. Um, and it's the same when I wrote about vaccines. I don't want to 
pull out particular people and start having a fight with them. I want to talk about the, the issues. I'm trying to talk about the themes. And yeah, just always having in mind, especially if you're a Christian, you better have this in mind all the time, that you're supposed to love your neighbor and your enemy and forgive everybody, including the people who call you a fascist. <laughs> you just have to, you just have to, whatever. People are going to say things. And just try to write honestly about what you th- believe in. I mean, my problem is that I've always lived in a world that I thought was wrong. There's something just cracked about it. And since I can't shut up, I've had to write about that. And that just gets you into the middle of the maelstrom. So you just have to deal with that. And But it's, it's actually really good. I see it now as a really good spiritual practice. You know, can you write about these things in a way that is not, not, I think something, I quoted something that Wendell Berry said when I first started writing my essays that I'm writing at the moment. He said, um, how can you, how can you challenge what the world is doing? How can you challenge what's wrong with the world without becoming evil? And that's the question, actually. And his answer, interestingly, was that you should never fight against what you hate. You should always fight for what you love. And that was really good. Um, and if you look at the writing of Wendell Berry, he always does that. You know, he certainly criticizes systems and, and businesses and, and ideas. But again, he doesn't ever personalize it. And he writes a lot about what matters instead. Because it's really easy to do the Nietzschean thing of looking into the abyss and then becoming the abyss. Yeah. Because you can go, whatever you believe in, you can go on the internet and you can find a thousand things that make you angry in five minutes. And then you can get on your Twitter account and start ranting about them. And the whole of the algorithm is designed to make you do that. So can you, can you write about what's wrong without becoming evil, without dehumanizing other people? So that, it's a really good spiritual challenge, actually. And that's what I try and see it as. I'm not suggesting I always get it right at all. Um, but I'm trying to do that. Paul Kingsnorth, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. And thank you. Well, what a rich conversation. I love talking about surrender and wisdom and the fact that there are some things we can't think ourselves into. I wonder how many of you were shouting at your phone, probably. Uh, who, for who that idea is just, you deeply disagree with it and you're very resistant to it. I would love to hear from you if you think it's dangerous to believe there are some things that our reason cannot get us to. We obviously talked about climate change and I always feel a duty of care when talking with people who are um, very pessimistic about where society is heading which I sort of feel sadly is a lot of people and a lot of people who are quite thoughtful and sensible. And so I don't necessarily think it's scaremongering and that is a hard thing. So I just wanted to name that that might have been hard to listen to. It was hard to listen to for me. It is something I'm working through personally. How do we uh, settle our souls and stabilize ourselves and become the kind of people that are needed if the future is indeed going to be more turbulent than the present. Um, so I just wanted to name that. Um, such an interesting line. I seem to have a habit of losing faith in things, worldly things, words, um, all the things we throw ourselves at. In some ways, it's a sort of classic midlife crisis, isn't it? It's, you know, David Brooks's second mountain thing. You spend the first half of your life building and climbing and framing this identity and pulling on levers. And then the second half of your life coming to terms with what isn't achievable and what you won't be um, and kind of reorienting your priorities. But it is always so interesting to me to hear people who have come to faith later in life, particularly those who didn't have it in their childhood. I think there's a, a slightly more well-trodden path of people who who had um, some connection with religion and then returned to it later. But for Paul, it's all brand new and um, very interesting to hear about. And then obviously we talked about vaccines and I don't think looking back, he gave me a good alternative phrase for vaccine hesitant. And obviously anti-vax is used as a insult. I genuinely don't therefore know how to describe his position in a way that is honouring. Um, but if you've listened, you will know his position, which is, I think, genuinely not so much about vaccines themselves, but about the broader 
context, the social pressure and stigma, some of the techniques that were used to try and get vaccine take up um, upwards. And actually, I have read his essays, The COVID Moment, and he was writing one of them at a time when Austria had actually um, passed a mandatory vaccine law. It was really quickly repealed, but it did pass that you could be forced to take a vaccine. And um, that kind of helped me understand a little bit. And hearing hearing the broader sense of the way vaccines played into pre-existing set of sensitivities and worries about technological social control also really helped me understand the position um it was one of the more interesting ones i i really like paul's writing and find it provocative and illuminating even when i don't dis i don't agree with it at all and uh but it was it's one of having someone on who you know vocally hasn't personally taken the covid vaccine and is happy to talk about the reasons why someone might not take the covid vaccine although he's very careful to say he is not pushing people one way or the other because I'm the daughter of two medics and um uh did have a real sort of wrestle with myself editorially about um harm and responsibility and um we've got to take our kids for polio boosters in London because the polio vaccine uptake in London is so low that it is beginning to threaten a polio outbreak in London. In fact, there has been a polio outbreak in London. So it's very real and live for me at the moment, the consequences of people not being vaccinated. And I will send this to Paul in advance, so I don't. I hope it won't be a shock to him. And I'm sure he is very able to take me saying this, but I did have a moment of like, how responsible is it? if I believe that people being vaccinated is for the public good to air these views, which complicate that narrative a bit. Um, but having listened to him, I am glad that I have. I think it is more complicated than we make out. And certainly the COVID vaccine in particular, because of the speed and the scale, I can understand why, um, why I have little understanding or empathy for vaccine hesitancy generally. Sorry, I know that's not the preferred term. Um, although I can, you know, respect people who hold those views and be in conversation with them and indeed love them. Um, I now have more when it comes to COVID because of the wider, the wider context. But there, it is interesting when you're listening across different and you're wanting to create a, a space for a range of views, what the limits of that are. I don't know, for example, if I would have would I have someone who is a very uh, direct and persuasive climate change denier? Because I think that people who have denied climate change and been publicly active around that have terribly slowed down our appropriate response to a problem that we should have acted on decades ago and creating legitimacy for not acting feels like it could have real harm. But... Is that letting myself off the hook, listening to things I find very difficult? I really valued talking to him at the end about con controversy and becoming a controversial figure and this sense that there is a sort of quite bullish and often male willingness to upset people and to say quite harsh things which actually I don't see in Paul and I wonder if it's because he's not on social media <laughs> you know there's a kind of constellation I spoke to Jonathan Pajot about this who's on later in the series a constellation of commentators who um, are seen as kind of conservative or traditionalist or more on the right of the spectrum um, some of whom are very interesting and very thoughtful and some of whom because of their behaviour online, I struggle to listen seriously to their ideas and um, feel like they're just scrapping out for a fight and don't care if they're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Um, but Paul is not that. He is both controversial and careful and thoughtful, I think. That is all from my slightly rambly reflections today. Thank you so much for listening to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield. You've been listening to an interview with Paul Kingsnorth. Our production team are... 
Daniel Turner and Lizzie Harvey. We are edited by Drew Hawley and The Sacred is a project of the think tank, The Oss. <laughs>